How is your ego getting in the way of your happiness and success? When do you put your desire for recognition above higher goals? Do you try to win fights with your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your boss? Do you ever feel like you always have to be right? Your ego is messing with you. How is your ego getting in your way? How do you conquer your ego? These are some of the questions we'll be answering in today's episode. And today my guest is Ryan Holiday, the author of the recently released book, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, to the uninitiated, Ryan was, uh, well, he actually is a best-selling author. He wrote the book, Trust Me, I'm Lying. Uh, he uh, apprenticed under Robert Greene, who's the, uh, the famous author of the book, 48 Laws of Power. He worked with Tucker Max, who's a friend of mine, and he was a director of marketing at Amer American Apparel, where his campaigns have been used as case studies by Twitter, YouTube, and Google. As you can tell, he's a, he's a big underachiever. Ryan Holiday, how are you, mate? Great to have you here. I'm doing great. It's good to talk to you. And you're joining us from your home in Austin, Texas. Is that right? I am. Yes. All right. And now you and I, this is the first time that you and I have actually connected officially. A few years ago, we were, were introduced, I think, by a mutual friend, Manish Sethi, and, and you were actually considering subletting my apartment in New York there. It's funny how that works. I went to middle school with Manish. Okay. And, and then the next thing I know, we got connected and we, we already knew a bunch of the same people anyway. I think we're sort of in the same circles. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you didn't take my apartment in the end. I did so. not. I took a much smaller apartment that I was much less happy with. I, I, I priced you out of the market, obviously. I was char uh, charging you too much. Uh, Ryan, mate, great to have you here. What, what is ego? Like, what is our ego? Well, there's, there's the Freudian definition, obviously, which is, is <clears throat> somewhat antiquated, of course. And then there's the sort of psychological definition of an egotist, which is, you know, a, a sort of a real diagnosis. I, I'm using ego in the colloquial sense. Um, Bill Walsh has this great line where he's saying, you know, ego is when confidence becomes arrogance. Um, I, I think it's, it's when um, <clears throat> we cease living in the actual world and we live in the world inside our own head when we, when we sort of live in our, our, the, the vivid illusions we create about who we are, about how other people are, about our place in the world. And so my, my contention is that this kind of ego, the idea that we're better than other people, that the rules don't apply to us, that we're the center of the universe, these things are very much at odds with any creative or entrepreneurial um, profession. Although they might help in some sort of short-term situations, eventually those costs catch up to you and, and, and can lead to, to really bad things. So when I think of someone who has a big ego, I think of someone who's kind of like cocky with a lot of bravado, which is, is certainly someone having a lot of ego, but it can be something else uh, quite different to that, can't it? Well, sure. I mean, confidence, I think, is essential, right? If you don't believe you can do something, you're probably not going to be able to do it. I, I think, you know, if confidence is based on having done the work, having received, you know, objective feedback, having a track record of success, whatever, that's great. You know, e the ego I'm talking about is the, is the Donald Trump-esque ego where uh, a man lives so fully inside his own world that in some ways, look, it's, it's certainly admirable in the way that he's able to get other people on board with this, but he is not living in the same universe that you and I are. And I'm not making a political statement here. I'm just saying this person lives in a different world than you and I do. And <clears throat> that, that can work until it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, it's very, very bad. There's a reason that you know, most, uh, most downfalls aren't, are, are perpetrated from the outside. They are, they are implosions, right? People, especially successful people, as you do things, you start to get this sense. There's this great line in, uh, in Billions, that Showtime show by Brian Koppelman, where he says, the, the main character, he says, you know, when people call you Superman long enough, you start to think you can fly. That's the problem because you can't fly. And so you, you end up overreaching or overestimating something or pissing the wrong person off. Um, and, and, and that's when all those chickens come home to roost. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's an interesting um, dynamic because I think of Kobe Bryant, the, the recently retired LA Lakers yeah. basketball star. 
And uh, I also think of Beyonce, the, the pop singer, and, 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 and various other high achievers often talk about creating like a character for themselves when they go on court or when they go to perform on stage. Um, Kobe Bryant considers himself Superman when he goes on stage. He, he kind of like imagines the cape being put on and he turns into a different personality when he's on the court with a huge ego and he's just like dictating play. Beyonce has said previously, I can't remember the name of the character that she creates for herself, but she says every time before she goes out on stage, she pretends that she's someone else. Sasha Fierce, I think, is the name. I think that's it, yes. Yeah. And, and so when she goes out there, now she's got this ego where she's like bravado and she's confident, she's making things happen. So it, it, is it true that we can actually harness the ego and this very thing for our own good um, and it's not actually causing us problems if we use it in certain situations. I'm not as familiar with Beyonce. She seems to be a, 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 a very successful person, but Kanye West to me is an interesting example for you to bring up. Uh, there's this uh, sort of epic rant that Jason Whitlock did right after Kobe retired that, that I think illustrates this. It, um, no one can argue that Kanye, or sorry, that Kobe is not an extraordinarily talented that he has not done things in basketball that no one has done before. But what I think is so interesting about, about Kobe is that um, he is clearly incapable of playing well with other players, right? Um, Jason Whitlock, he was saying, on the, on the one hand, you know, Kobe had won a lot for the Lakers. But if you look at the Lakers post-Kobe uh, leaving, the, the franchise is destroyed. It's going to take years and years for them to recover. So what's interesting is that often ego um, – is really good in some cases for the person doing it, but has a is a is a to, um, is putting the costs onto onto other people in that way. So, how many more championships could Kobe have won if he'd been able to to play with Shaq for a longer period of time? If he hadn't driven him out of LA, if he hadn't driven other players out of LA, if he hadn't been able if he'd been able to build a succession plan or or to sort of uh, maybe coast more to a stop instead of having this abrupt end. What, what, what's so interesting about Kobe is that his ego made him extraordinarily successful, but it often came at the, success, at the expense of everyone else on the Lakers team. And you see that with, you know, even someone like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, obviously a wonderful basketball player and, and from what I understand, a pretty decent human being. But when you're punching members of your own team in the face, um, your ego is not serving you well, right? These people, these are not your enemies. These are quite literally on the same team as you. And yet somehow, you know, you, you find yourself deliberately hurting them. And so it, my, my contention is not that ego and success are, are mutually exclusive. It's that often, even in really successful people, ego is there making their lives more difficult. And, and you know, if a Kanye West or a Kobe Bryant or a Michael Jordan could have harnessed that part of themselves just a tiny bit more how much more could they have accomplished mm. it's interesting isn't it because we we as a society when it comes to michael jordan obviously we, we consider him the greatest athlete of all time it's debatable mm -hmm. depending on what sport what sport or you can right. see athleticism but certainly he's won, he won six nba titles and he is certainly revered as being the greatest basketballer of all time if not the greatest athlete so there seems to be some kind of like almost philosophical contradiction there because as a society we consider jordan to be the best and right. we copy what he does um but yet at the same time you seem to be saying well in actual fact there are things that we shouldn't admire about that and that that comes at a, at a high cost i think that's right it, like when, when we hold up someone like michael jordan we're not looking at him as a human being we're looking at him as a machine who did this one thing very well right mm -hmm. we're not saying hey i'd like that guy to be my father right because we, we haven't analyzed that part of his personality i think you look at someone like steve jobs uh, is another interesting example right extraordinarily talented his ego is so bad early on in apple's trajectory that 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 john scully the ceo that that jobs had hired is forced to fire him. Mm. And, and when you really look at the reasons that John Scully did that, they're hard to argue with. Like you would have fired Steve Jobs and I would have fired Steve Jobs and we probably would have been right for it. Not just because he was berating people, because he was unmanageable, but because the, the company wasn't performing. 
right? And it was only Steve Jobs leaving, um, forced to sort of go on this journey, start another company, learn some lessons, that he comes back and is a successful CEO. Um, but but that could have very easily been the end of the story, right? Like the, the, the fact that he was able to come back and create Apple into being one of the most successful companies in history was, um, was a, in some ways a lucky break. What he did wasn't lucky, but getting that second chance, we don't always get those. And so I think you wanna look at, at the gamble that, that, that ego takes. Someone like Lance Armstrong's maybe an example. Like he cheated, he almost got away with it, but then he didn't and then it all came crumbling down. And, and so I want people to be aware of what that risk is with ego, to, to know that it, you can choose it as your fuel, but the evidence historically tends to show that it's very bad fuel or it's like jet fuel. It'll work or it'll explode all over you and, and you know, take you with it. I was, uh, I was at Arnold Schwarzenegger's home in Los Angeles on Saturday night, and I was very fortunate enough to speak with him one-on-one -on -one for about five minutes at one point, and then in his kitchen in a small group of five people, and we were talking about a lot of things. And um, uh, my listeners on the James Swanick Show will know I actually posted an episode uh, just this week about how I managed to get uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to wear my blue light blocking glasses that I sell, yeah. my Swanee's glasses. And if you're listening to this and you haven't uh, yet heard that uh, interview, go back um, a week or so, depending on when you're listening to this, and you can hear the story. I've got audio there of, uh, of Arnold Schwarzenegger talking to me, or you can go to my Facebook page, James Swanick Official, and see the actual video of, uh, of Arnold wearing my glasses. But we're talking about Michael Jordan. We're talking about Steve Jobs. It's very interesting. Arnold Schwarzenegger, I admire him greatly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he has achieved seven-time Mr. Olympia. He uh, became the governor of California. He gives an enormous amount uh, to charities. He inspires people to be healthy. And he's got a big ego. Like he does have a big ego. You would have to have a big ego to accomplish all of those things. Yet, right, most of us would have stopped after any number of those things and said, I did it. Right. Right. But, you know, obviously he had this, this I guess you could call it a scandal four or five years ago when it came out that he'd fathered a love child with his housekeeper and his marriage to Maria Shriver obviously collapsed. Um, and now they're d uh, divorced and he's living... Uh, by himself in this in this big home and so you can look at it i guess that's another another example of saying there's someone whose ego maybe got in the way now we don't know the intricacies of what right. of what happened there where it can only assume but is that another example of someone whose ego has 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 the jet fuel has run out so to speak and all of a sudden they've imploded self-imploded I think we all have examples like that in our own lives. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm not trying to make an example out of these people and say, like, these are horrible people. What I'm saying is that, you know, with ambition comes ego. And if you're not vigilant against it, it's not, hey, I don't have an ego because I read this book about meditation and now it's gone forever. It's that the more you do and the more you accomplish, the more seductive ego is going to be, right? Because not only do you start to think you're great, but literally everyone you meet tells you how great you are, right? So we all have that in us. We all tend to, to, to begin to overestimate our abilities. We tend to, to start to think we're untouchable. We start to think, um, it's, obviously ego manifests itself differently based on where we happen to be in life, but we all have that temptation. And so I think you can look at some of these well-known figures and see that, that what it ultimately did was was some significant damage and then i i think we should be in some ways i think writing some of these people off as as being egotistical um doesn't or, or attributing their success to their ego doesn't give them the credit they deserve in the sense that kanye west is not a great rapper because he has a huge ego he's a great rapper because he did the fucking work you know what i mean because he's a he's a creative person who is who has lived and breathed this craft for a really long time and he and, and he's built relationships and he's a savvy marketer and all of these things. That's why he's great. I would argue that ego is the reason he gets up on stage and interrupts Taylor Swift for no real reason mm. and turns a lot of people who should be his fans against him. To me, that's where the ego is. The ego that, 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 um, that the, the force that drove him to create, um, you know, watch the throne. That wasn't ego. That was sort of 
creative joy and 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 brilliance and so i think we we've, we've got to make that distinction and, and make sure that we're we're both giving people the credit they deserve and holding them accountable for for their flaws as well we're talking to ryan holiday who is the author of the recently released and published book ego is the Anim enemy ego is the enemy it's a philosophical exploration of difficulties we create for ourselves in life uh, send Ryan a tweet right now at Ryan holiday. Uh, make sure you, you send me in there as well at James Swanick and just let Ryan know that, uh, you enjoyed listening to him or give us a, a little tip on one, one takeaway from this episode. I'm sure Ryan would love to retweet you as will I, um, just taking it away from like ego of trying to get praise and success and all that kind of stuff. If we just look at it from a merely one-on-one -on -one point of view, let's just say a, a romantic couple, for example, sure. husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. Um, just last night I had an argument with the uh, romantic interest in my life with my girlfriend. And uh, you know, I found myself in the moment thinking that I was right, feeling that I was right, and really wanting to have a need to prove that I was right. Sure. And I'm sure anyone who's in a, in a, in a relationship would probably feel this way. That's my ego getting in the way, right, Ryan? I, I think it is. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the need to be sort of above someone or to need to, to, to maybe make someone below you, I think is, is one manifestation of ego. The other thing too is like we sort of get locked in these someone says something and so then we reply and then all of a sudden we've gone down this sort of escalation or it's a downward spiral and now none of us wants to admit defeat or admit that we don't care about this thing nearly as much as as we sort of put into it and and so it when you can put your ego aside and, and actually think about that other person and go like hey they probably don't want to admit that they're wrong either or hey maybe they don't care about this as much as as they're acting like either you can sometimes de-escalate those situations but again this is all much easier said than done but i think you make a good point ego is not just a problem because it's going to ruin the the multi-million dollar business that you've created if you can't see the the people in your life as their own people with their own wants needs and desires and 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 genuinely care about that if you can only care about yourself not only does that make you an asshole but it's going to make you very hard for for people to put up with when has ego in that situation got in your way ryan um in in my personal life uh yeah. i mean all 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 the time right it's uh for for I'll, I'll give you an example i think we're all kind of trying to recreate or address some problem that we have in our childhood obviously this is not my insight it's pretty common in psychology but it's like if your parents, let's say, didn't recognize you enough or didn't uh, acknowledge you know, what you did enough, then sometimes you'll look for that in your partner and be totally crushed when you know, they didn't notice that you got your hair cut or they didn't notice when you did this. These, these sort of minor things that, that to you have, have become huge deals, but since you can't articulate why they're a huge deal, you just feel resentful or angry or... or, or um, you know, slighted in some way. So I think resentment is, is to me a big form of ego. And it's, it's something that I suffer with. You sort of collect these slights or these doubts that you then kind of explode about. And, and look, that doesn't, that doesn't make you a pleasant person to be with. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't treat the person that you're with very well either. The, the bigger one for me um, in my personal relationship, it's somewhat related to work is the inability to say no or have any real sort of balance in my life. Right. So I, I open the book. I talk a lot about like I, I sort of struggle with sort of compulsive working. Right. Like to me, work always is easy and it always goes pretty well. Right. But relationships are complicated. You know, doing stuff around the house is complicated. It, that doesn't come as easily to me. So it's like I can I can sort of be off in my own world. I can. Hey, I just need to run up, you know, check something on my computer. And four hours later, I come back and I'm like, you know, I, I just expected this person to wait for me, which is, you know, an inherently selfish thing to do. So, so that sort of balance, this idea, there's this wonderful quote from Bertrand Russell where he says, the first sign of an impending nervous collapse is the belief that your work has become terribly important. <laughs> and I think, I, think I, I suffer from that. Yeah. 
It's funny, you know, in, um, in terms of, uh, of ego with me, I, I feel like I have a lot of ego when it comes to my family back in Australia. Well, I have, my parents are in, uh, both live in Brisbane, Australia, as does my youngest brother, uh, Tristan, who's now a business partner of mine in, in my Swannies blue light blocking glasses. And then my brother Edward is a, is a house master and deputy headmaster over in, in the UK. Yeah. And as it comes to uh, entrepreneurship, or entrepreneur endeavors, I feel, I, I definitely feel like I have an ego because my, my dad wasn't and isn't an entrepreneur, nor is my right. mother, nor is my brother, neither, neither, neither are two of my brothers. You know, my brother right. has a job over in the UK. My brother, Tristan, I'm now sort of teaching or helping or, or, or sure. into the entrepreneurial journey. So one of the big complaints that I get from my youngest brother as we're talking about growing the business is that I patronize him or I speak to him in a way, or I talk down to him. Sure. Um, when my mother, who's very conservative and she doesn't really know what I, what I do, she just wants me to get a job and right. get a safe 100 grand a year salary with full medical benefits so I don't have the up and downs of, of right. the entrepreneurial journey. I, can't, I feel myself thinking I'm separate. I'm so sure. smart. I'm so clever because I went to America and I'm learning from these amazing people and great coaches. And I'm interviewing people like Ryan Holiday here and I'm getting mentored by Ty Lopez. And they're just sitting back in Australia, this cute little island, not really knowing what's going. Right. And so I feel that ego and I don't like it about myself, but I, sure. feel, but I feel it. What's going on there, Ryan, based on your research? Like, why am I feeling that? And I guess, I guess I should say it's a good thing that I recognize it as well, right? Absolutely. There's this uh, line, um, there's this great book in um, the Alcoholics Anonymous community called The New Pair of Glasses. And, and the, the, the writer, he's talking, he defines ego as a conscious separation from. Mm. And so what he means is ego is when you suddenly think that you're more different than other people or other things than you are the same. When you have that sort of conscious separation. And I feel that too. It's like, you guys don't, you don't know what it's like to be me, right? That's the idea that you're somehow special and better or different than everyone else. And look, obviously there are differences and we all have our unique experiences, but that sort of sense of superiority, I feel that too. It comes from childhood. I think if, if you feel like maybe your parents didn't recognize you or understand you, you, you can start to, you look inward instead of getting that external validation that every child should get you you kind of go, well, why am I special? And you look for other things. Mm -hmm. And that can often be in your work or in your identity as a successful person. And so you, you end up as, as a byproduct, condescending to other people, bossing them around, being really controlling, you know, uh, being dismissive, those sort of things. Um, and, and that's really bad. I think w what you're talking about can manifest itself even worse. Like, all of a sudden, let's say your company now employs 200 people. Well, you're going to have to be able to trust a lot of those people and delegate a lot of work to them and, and give them responsibilities. What I think you see with a lot of egotists, like to, not to go back to Donald Trump, but like Donald Trump is running his campaign with like seven people and Hillary has almost a thousand people working for her. And part of Trump's problem is that he's a micromanager. He's such a control freak and he thinks he's so special that he has to be in control all the time. That's why he says so many dumb things on Twitter because other people can't interrupt him and say, hey, you shouldn't do that. He doesn't, he's not able to hand that off to another smart person. Mm. And so a lot of entrepreneurs have that trouble. Their, their identity is so tied up in being special or better that it, that it ultimately stymies the business and prevents them from expanding and scaling. Yeah, I definitely feel those uh, at times. Um, the the sense of superiority. Uh, I know sometimes I come across as condescending and dismissive uh, when it comes to my conversation with my brother. I'm very conscious of it. I'm trying to work. I'm, I'm trying to to work on it. Um, they say that uh, recognizing it or being a, awareness is the first step, right? So I do have that. Uh, awareness. And I think what, what really drives this is that I, I really, even the fact that I moved to America from Australia w was my way of kind of separating from what I saw to be mediocre thinking or, yes. or, or, or me not wanting to consider myself being mediocre. I always wanted to go and make it and, 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 and achieve great success. And that 
ego, because it is ego, has driven me. Like it's yeah. driven me. I mean, I, I, I did what in my world seemed impossible, which was I became a sports center anchor on ESPN for a couple of years with zero television experience. And when I got that job and finally I was on TV and I'm hanging out with Tom Brady and Kobe Bryant, all these famous people, I was like giving myself a pat on the back going, right. yeah, you see what I mean? You took the risk, you moved over to America and you lived in a hostel paying $15 a night, but then you finally made it. And right. then that kind of like gave me that sense of like, sure, sense of superiority. So I don't know. I mean, I, it's, such a, it's such a great contradiction because that ego drove me to that. And I loved the fact that I accomplished that. And it gives me so much happiness. But at the same time, I do feel that sense of superiority in some cases with some people. Well, what's so, so interesting is that like to build a company, you had to make something where there wasn't something before. To write a book, you have to take an idea in your head, which everyone has hundreds of times a day, and then you turned that into 300 pages right. or, or to, you know, to be a champion in a sport. It's like to be the, the heavyweight champion of the world. You have to literally beat into submission the other strongest people in the world, right? Like, right. And, and that Muhammad Ali says, you know, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. That's what he said. And it's true. But that's why we have to work so hard. Um, because we have to work so hard to fight that because here's the thing, just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be good at these other things. So I think Kanye West, again, an interesting example, brilliant musician. He announced a couple months ago that he was like $50 million in debt because of his fashion empire. It just keeps not working. And, and that's what I see a lot with the entrepreneurs that I deal with or, you know, successful people that I advise. They, they, they start to believe, <clears throat> excuse me, they start to believe they have the Midas touch, right? That because the first thing they touch turned to gold or the first 50 things that they touch turned to gold, that that's what's going to happen every single time. And, and they tell themselves the wrong story and they often are sloppier on the future projects or they overestimate the demands of the audience. They start to, they start to read um, the evidence in a very self-serving way and then all of a sudden they overreach and, you know, we're all just a few bad decisions away from everything toppling. <laughs> so that's why ego is so dangerous. It's dangerous, isn't it? It is yeah. dangerous. It's dangerous. And how do, are we born with this or do we develop it? Like, is it, is it nature or nurture? I think it's, it's, it's both. I mean, obviously there'd be some evolutionary reasons to care about yourself uh, a lot. Um, but I, 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 I have to think that our sort of self-esteem culture must contribute to it. Um, you know, the, this, my generation sort of raised with these helicopter parents who, who sort of interfere with every single thing. They tell you how amazing you are. You know, they value self-esteem above everything else. And then I, I also wonder, it's like, for instance, you have this podcast. So you know that you have an audience and you're, that you're kind of performing for that audience. Like, you know, that you in your underwear at midnight is not exactly the same as who you are when you sit down to write an article or send an email or mm -hmm. do your podcast. So you know that there's like the sort of performance James and then kind of regular James. Um, and, and there's a lot of warnings for people in our space about making sure that, you know, you don't let this stuff go to your head. Mm -hmm. But what about a world where suddenly everyone has an Instagram account and a Twitter account with followers and fans? Now everyone is sort of a, a quote unquote performer, mm -hmm. especially young kids, but they're not really taught any of the, the skills or the warnings about balancing that. So that's what I think is so scary. So what are some examples of, of, of people who have really mastered of finding the right balance between healthy ego, if you like, or like enough, enough ego where it's like, they're a little bit cocky. They're a little bit arrogant. They harness that to really make things happen, but yet they're also so aware that they do incorporate others, that they are respected, that they do have that sense of, of, uh, of, of, uh, humility, I guess. Yeah. Well, one, one of the stories I tell in the book that is someone I've, I've come to admire a lot is, is, is George Marshall, um, who the Marshall Plan is named after. Um, he was uh, a brilliant general who sort of time and time again put his, his own needs behind the needs of the country. For instance, 
uh, FDR offered him the chance to lead the troops at D-Day, which would have been a life-changing opportunity, right? It sort of launches Eisenhower to the presidency. But um, George Marshall says to him, hey, look, I, I don't want any of my personal feelings to decide, who you, to decide who gets this job. I want you to pick the best person for it. Um, but at the same time, he was very proud of the fact that he was a general. He insisted that FDR refer to him as General Marshall, not as George, right? So he's proud of his accomplishments, but he's also not going to put that pride ever in the way of what he's sort of signed on to do or the mission that he's serving. There's a, a story... Um, uh, about Marshall, he sits for this po official portrait that he needed to sit for a really long time. So, you know, you go, you show up, they paint you, you go, they show up, they paint you. And then the, the artist goes, all right, you're done, we're set. And Marshall, he just gets up to leave. Um, and uh, the painter's like, but don't you want to see the painting? And he's like, no, 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 it's all right, I got to go. Because he is like, what does he need to look at a picture of himself for, right? He knows what he looks like. Um, and, and, what what Marshall did, it, it, someone asked his wife, you know, they were like, how is your, how, how did your husband sort of not have this ego? And she said, look, he's just like you. He has the same drives and urges that you have. He's just conquered. He's just worked at them, right? He's just decided not to let them lead him down the bad road. You compare that to someone like General MacArthur, also a brilliant general, but this sort of vain, um, uh, arrogant man who ultimately sort of uh, is, is forced to be recalled by Truman because because of of, of his you know repeated ins insubordination. So I when I look at someone like Marshall and I see the Marshall Plan, I see that he was Secretary of State, Secretary of of Defense, that he that he was um, you know our our essential diplomat in in sort of op one of the openings of China. You know that that he. He led the troops in World War I, that he did all the organization and this sort of brilliant logistic work in World War II. I see someone who's in, accomplished more than sort of you and I could ever dream of, but he was, the reason he was able to do that is that he mastered his ego and that's, it might not be as sexy. They didn't make a movie about Marshall the way they did about Patton, but we got to remember that Patton's attitude, what made him such a cinematic figure is also what got him in trouble all the time. Right. I, I know mastering the ego, you said something there, mastering the ego. That's, that's powerful. I'm actually going to write that down. So to remember the whole thing when it comes to like mastering the ego, you use the example of Bill Belichick, who's the, the New England Patriots head yeah. coach. If you follow the uh, American football, the NFL, Bill Belichick has won Super Bowls with uh, Tom Brady as the quarterback. Why is he an example of someone who's, who has seemingly mastered their, their ego, Ryan? Well, one of my favorite Bill Belichick stories is, is they, the New England Patriots drafted Tom Brady in the sixth round, yeah. right? It's probably the single best draft pick in the history of football, right? To get a three-time Super Bowl winning champion, multi-MVP, 12-season quarterback in the sixth round, like, you know, 200, the 200th pick or whatever is absurd. That would be like, you know, um, investing in Microsoft, Amazon, and Google <laughs> all on the IPO on the same day. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. unheard of. But when you, when you, when, when you talk to the Patriots and, and David Halberstram, a uh, wonderful biography of Bill Belichick is a good source for this. The Patriots were not pleased three seasons later or two seasons later when Tom Brady turned out to be the superstar. Obviously, they, they were glad, but they, the, their first instinct was to go, how did we get this so wrong? How was our intelligence and our scouting so off that we let this superstar dwindle or, you know, sort of dangle there until the sixth round? And, and, and so what, what I think really great people who have mastered the ego do is they don't care what you think of them. They don't care about the external scorecard. They have a sort of an internal scorecard, an inner model of perfection that they're that they're pursuing and holding themselves against. So Bill Belichick doesn't care that you think he's the greatest uh, coach in the world or that he's a, a genius. He cares about the standards that he holds himself to and what he thinks is possible to do in the game. And I think that's inherently humbling. I, I, look, I, I, I'm, I don't know Bill, so I, I can't tell you that he's an egoless person, but he has clearly built a franchise that has managed to avoid the pitfalls of ego and entitlement and, uh, and self-absorption that has, that has made it harder for other teams to last, you know, even half as long as the Patriots. 
We're talking to Ryan Holiday, who is the author of the book, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, his previous book was The Obstacle is the Way. Uh, and his first book was uh, Trust Me, I'm Lying. Um, you can find him on Twitter at, at Ryan Holiday. He's also uh, online at ryanholiday.com. Make sure you check him out. Uh, Ryan, let's do some actionable steps here. The viewer or listener right now uh, who's listening to this and maybe they're aware now of their own ego and where it's, it's playing havoc with their own life. What is, let, let's go over, say, three actionable steps that we can do here to, to recognize when ego is happening and how to either harness it or master it or eliminate it depending on the circumstance. I think you want to consciously, the first one I would say is you want to consciously pick up the mantle of, of a student, right? Of that sort of beginner's mindset. The longer you can keep that, the better you're going to be. You know, there's this Epictetus quote where he says, one cannot learn that which they think they already know. And, and if, if you can remember that, if you can remember that, you know, sort of pride and arrogance and, and, and um, know-it-allism is actually going to prevent you from learning and it's going to inflate the ego you're going to do yourself a big favor, right? So you want, to, you want to say, hey, there's always something for me to learn. There's an Emerson quote. He says, you know, every man that I meet in one way or another is my superior, and I'm going to be able to learn from him. And so if you can, if you can say that, that's, I think that's going to knock your ego down uh, a, a peg or two and, and, and be very important. Um, Pat Riley has this concept of the disease of me. This would be the second one um, where he's saying, you know, a team comes together and that you know they all have this shared common goal but then when success arrives then all of a sudden it's about sort of getting yours right it's like why does he get paid more than me why does the media care more about him than me so if you can fight that disease of me right that sort of selfishness that um putting your own needs above other people um is it tony adams there's that line um uh you know play for the jersey or play for the name on the front of the jersey and they'll remember the name on the back so you, say, you realize that like sort of doing great work and not so much caring about the credit or the attention might have some cost in the short term. I think over the long term, it's better. Um, and then th there's another thing you said, you're talking to Robert Greene. You should ask him about this. Um, when I was sort of thinking about uh, changing my life, I wanted to become a writer and I had a really good job at the time. I was at American Apparel. I, I knew I had about a year before I could make that leap. And, and Robert, he said to me, um, you know, okay, you have a choice now. Is that year, is that going to be a live time for you or dead time? So he's saying, how are, in, instead of, you know, bemoaning the fact that you have to go to this office every day for a year, instead of, you know, complaining that you're stuck in traffic or that you're, you know, someone was late, you know, whatever we do when we, we are stuck with like time that we didn't plan for, he said, how are you going to sort of live and breathe in every single moment and get every single bit out of it, right? Which is a, I think an inherently unegotistical thing to do to, to, instead of complaining about, you know, your plane being an hour late, you're like, okay, I got an hour more to work un uninterrupted. And so that a lifetime dead time calculation is one that I try to make constantly. Um, and, and if you are constantly choosing a lifetime, you are going to over time pull ahead of all the other people who waste their time complaining or blaming other people or, or just, you know, twiddling their thumbs. I think that that last point, a lifetime dead time, and said another way, could be just being grateful, expressing gratitude. Sure. Um, when I wake up in, in the morning, uh, most days, I don't do it every day, but most days I write in uh, a book called Five Minute Journal. Uh, I love that. A couple of my friends actually created it. You can check yeah. it out at fiveminutejournal.com. And uh, it asks you, you know, one very simple question, which is what are three things you're grateful for today? And mm -hmm. just doing that for just two minutes, I mean, 120 seconds. It's amazing how you get out of your head. Like you get out, yes. like uh, I didn't realize I was getting out of my ego, but now that we've had this conversation, Ryan, I'm realizing that's actually what, what you're doing because it's humbling you. It's going, wow, I'm so appreciative of the fact that I slept in a comfortable bed with a roof over my head today. Sure. I'm so appreciative that I got to interview cool people like Ryan Holiday and Robert Green today. I'm so appreciative for the wonderful friends in my life uh, because I know a lot of people don't have a lot of friends and a lot of people yeah. don't sleep under a roof or in a bed. That is very much a, getting you into a, a feeling of gratitude and getting out of your ego 
now that I'm just realizing this, that that is just a great daily practice. Do you do something like that, Ryan? Or? You're, you're, you're totally right. Um, I think it's not just gratitude, but it's also removing expectations, right? Mm. Like being able to, to greet when you're, when you're grateful waking up that you're alive, you're going to be less upset when you look outside and it's raining unexpectedly or, you know, that uh, it's too hot or that you've got a bunch of meetings you don't want to do. You can sort of put some of those expectations aside. It's easier to appreciate whatever there is and whatever happens. I, I know Alex and uh, who, who does five minute journal. I, I love yeah. what they're doing. I, I just write in a plain Moschine where I just write, you know, I try to write what I did the day before, what I've got coming up, um, you know, what, what I feel like I can do better, what I'm working on. Um, and I try to write what I'm grateful for as well. I think, I think journaling in the morning is very, very important. It's sort of forced meditation, but not in the sit there and think nothing sense. Yeah. It's good for people with really bad cases of ADD. Totally. <laughs> um, Tony Robbins says it another way, actually. He says, live in appreciation, not expectation. So yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Start living in appreciation. All right. So three tips there from ryan holiday on how to master the ego number one was consider yourself a student always be learning a great quote there every man is my superior and i will learn from them so uh always be constantly learning here's just one little caveat to that it's like the more the more that i learn ryan the, the more egotistical i seem to get because i know that friends or family who aren't learning as much as me i'd be i feel like i'm just progressing so much so well let me let me give you a quote then that i think might work on that there's uh john john wheeler who's a physicist um he would he says as our island of knowledge grows so too does our shoreline of ignorance so mm. instead of focusing on how much bigger your island is to other people you know, you want to focus on all the things that you now know that you have no idea about. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, you know, Socrates is, was considered, you know, the wisest man who ever lived because he, he knew how much he didn't know. And so I think if you focus, if you just flip it, it's the same fundamental reality. But yeah, you're right. It'll, it'll, it'll prevent that from happening. Yeah, it's, you're right. I mean, it's, it's amazing just like how again, going back to Tony Robbins, he says, change your language, change your thought patterns, change your yes. life. Yeah. It, it's like, if you say, oh man, life is hard, then you're going to see everything as hard. If you say life is a gift, then you're going to look at everything as a gift. If you say life is a party. Whoa. Then you're yeah. going to look at every opportunity as a party. Same, same thing as this example, you can go, I'm so smart because I get to interview the world's smartest people. I'm so cool. Cause I was hanging out with Arnold Schwarzenegger the other night. Or you can say, whoa, man, I, I, I have so much to learn about life. I am clueless when totally. it comes to like the amount of amazing things that are going on with people and, and psychology and things and success. Man, I'm just a student. I'm just like this humble student. Right. Switch right. it around like that. It just gives it a completely different meaning. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius, he says, you know, our life is what our thoughts make it. And so I think if you choose those right thoughts, it... it it can combat some of those things. Yeah. So yeah, number one was consider yourself a student, always be learning. The second tip from Ryan Holiday to master the ego was fight the disease of me, selfishness. Mm -hmm. Don't care about the attention so much. Be thinking about how you could, I mean, even just a simple little daily exercise is how can I help people? How can I just do a little thing of helping people? I remember right up before 2010, I was always going into rela new relationships thinking, how can this person help me? Sure. And, then, and then I read Keith Ferrazzi's book, Never Eat Alone. And it was all about helping other people first. And I just completely switched it on its head. And I, start, I drew up a list on a whiteboard, not dissimilar to the one that you see behind me. And I just wrote, out my, wrote down my friends at the time. And over the next two or three weeks, I just systematically went, I've uh, tried to find a way that I could help my friends, whether it was just connecting them or sending them a news article or right. whatever, something very small, man, that totally transformed my life because a week after I'd helped out a friend of mine uh, with something, he reached out to me and said, Hey James, ESPN is looking for an international anchor for sports center. And I thought you'd wow. be really cool for it. Can I introduce you to a producer there? And I said, hell yeah. Sure. And then long story short, I ended up going through a process of, 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 
becoming a sports center anchor. If you haven't read that story, if you go to my blog, James Swanick, and just type in how I bluffed ESPN, you can just see the whole story there about um, the process that I did to with zero television experience, going to ESPN, auditioning, then finally becoming a sports center anchor. The point of this story is this. Um, the moment that I stopped thinking, how can someone help me? And I turned it around to how can I help that person? Guess what? People started helping me. The sure. very thing that I dreamed of doing, hosting a TV show, came true because I helped someone else. And that's what Ryan's talking about here, fighting the disease of me, fighting that disease of selfishness. Be trying to think of other people and help other people first, and it will come back to you. Right, Ryan? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. And then the third tip is... Uh, instead of bemoaning your experience, ask yourself, how are you going to breathe in every moment and get everything out of it? Alive time versus dead time. Remove expectations, live in appreciation, not expectation. So there you go. Three tips there from Ryan Holiday on how to master the ego. Make sure that you check out Ryan's uh, new book, which is Ego is the Enemy. Where can our listener and viewer grab your book, Ryan? Uh, Amazon, bookstores, everywhere, as far as I know. There you go. It's everywhere. Just type in ego is the enemy and you'll be able to find that. Any parting words, Ryan, to sort of summarize and nicely put a bookend to this conversation here about ego? Well, look, I, I really liked what you were just talking about, about helping other people. And I think the story of how you and I got connected is exactly the same way. You don't, not only do you never know how reaching out to someone or doing something is going is, is, is gonna to work out for you, but also, you know, I, I think Tim Ferriss has said this, it's when he, when he meets people, he always says, like, treat them as though they're an editor at the New York Times, um, because they might become one someday, or they might know an editor at the New York Times. And so it's like, imagine if you and I had had some nasty conversation quibbling about like how much an apartment should rent for, you know, that four years later, that comes back to bite someone in the ass, right? So it's like, part of part of the problem with ego is that when you're in its sway, you don't treat other people well and you don't, you have no idea how, the ways in which that might be holding you back. Yeah, wonderful. Beautifully said. Ryan Holiday, thank you so much for your time, mate. I really appreciate it. It's been great to, to finally connect with you uh, versus uh, over, only over email. And yeah, so we'll have to see each other in person sometime. That would be great, Ryan. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Make sure you check out Ryan's book, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, his previous books, obviously, the obstacle uh, include The Obstacle is the Way. You can check him out at ryanholiday.com. Do go and send a tweet right now uh, to Ryan Holiday, uh, at Ryan Holiday and at James Swanick. Uh, please do... Uh, share this episode with someone who you think uh, needs a little bit of help with mastering the ego. <laughs> Get it out there to the world. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you to the listener and the viewer. And I will catch you on the next one. See ya. I'll tell you right now. How do you get smarter in seconds? Do some jumping jacks in the spot. This is the world's leading, one of the world's leading neuroscientists acting like a